I've been seeing way too much of the idea that the Vikings should just like sit Pat at 11 and take Michael Penix. You don't want that. What are you talking about? Don't lie to yourself. You don't want that. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day, each and every single day. I appreciate you all so very much. If you are new to the Locked On Vikings podcast, hello and welcome. You can find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it is an audio listening podcast, app like the Sirius XM app. You can also find the show on YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, which is America's number one sports book. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get 200 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. I want to address the idea today of the Vikings taking their picks at 11 and 23 and just sitting there and picking them. This is not an impossibility, I would say, but I I would be very shocked to hear that it is preferred. So today I would like to argue against the idea on its merits while still acknowledging there's a world where you just get backed into that corner if like every single thing goes wrong for you. Uh, but that is, this is the fallback, right? This is the worst it gets is that they take a quarterback at 11 because the top four guys got taken by someone else. Trade ups fell through for whatever reason. And where do we go from there? We shouldn't want this though. And I I see too many people wanting this. I, I get the temptation, right? Where you're thinking about maybe giving up three first round picks. I just talked to Mike debate on yesterday's show, maybe four first round picks, right? Like what's the... The, you know, both 11 and 23 and the 2025 first and the 2026 first to see if you can move them off the quarterback. Um, whatever happens there, it's easy to look at all of that capital walking out the door and kind of wanting to reach after it. I get it. I do. Uh, but the, the crux of the argument that I'm making today is that the quarterback position is more important than whatever those first round picks are going to turn into. And while four is a lot, and I super get that that might just be too rich for your blood, especially considering the option of go, of trading a little less to go up and get J.J. McCarthy, which is really what you're comparing that with, right? You're comparing the idea of like, say, four first round picks up for uh, for Drake May or two first round, just 11 and 23, and then maybe some other day two swapping or something that goes down for um, pick number four. And wanting to say, hey, you know, I still like J.J. McCarthy plenty and let's give up less draft capital. Way more sympathetic to that. Super get that. Um, Even though I think I still am just like a purist on just get the best quarterback in the building, however you have to, right? Um, And whoever you think that guy is. But taking it all the way to the other end of the spectrum and saying, let's just, you know, let's take Michael Penix and, you know, whatever edge rusher is there, right? Or, you know, some people are daydreaming about taking a wide receiver for the second year in a row, which I think is kind of crazy. Uh, they they could use like a wide receiver three type to maybe push like Trent Sherfield and Brandon Powell. <laughs> like they, they do need a guy in that room, but a first round pick is kind of crazy for that. Um, I could see like a fourth rounder, you know, extra competition and then hope somebody kind of steps up there. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's a it's a 12 and 21 personnel world. So that's not the vital position that it maybe was a couple years ago or like for the 2018 Rams that lived in 11 or anything like that. It's it's about the best players, right? Anyways, so I, I get the temptation to want to, you know, keep pick 23 and keep your team on like a normal track. That said... The idea of Michael Penix is not one that I am excited about at all. And I think if I thought he were a better quarterback, I'd be super into this idea. But I don't buy it. And here's why I don't buy it. Uh, and, and I went over this in a lot of depth a couple of months ago on this show. If you want to scroll back and find that show, if you're really interested in my evaluation of Michael Penix, you can get that because I did a whole show on him. Um, but basically... 
there is a really alarming consistency issue with his accuracy. And he did have a lot of cool, accurate highlights. There's a throw from the from the game against Texas, the was the Sugar Bowl, uh, that is will just knock your socks off in the red zone, like really tight window, layering it in. It's it's phenomenal. But the thing that I guess I've learned the most about the draft in the last two years when I kind of have decided to be a little more serious about it is that the the things that will never let you down are the things that a guy does every play, not the things that a guy does on the play you remember the best. What happens down to down to down to down to down? What are the consistent patterns, the consistent behaviors that always, always, always happen? And for Penix, those accurate knock-your-socks-off hits are interspersed with just as many I'm-gonna-vomit-in-my-lap misses. And I can't have that in an offense that is clearly trying to gear up and get a young quarterback on that rookie contract and make a window out of it. And I think we can sort of see, if you really want to zoom out super big picture, what's the plan to get to the Super Bowl, right? That's what we all want. Um, And the actual plan to get a trophy in Minnesota to me, revolves around that. That's the way that I see the Vikings are approaching this now. We wanted, we want to make sure that we have a foundation around this quarterback so that if he comes in and he hits the ground running, that this team can contend immediately. And we aren't sitting there like the way the Panthers are, enduring a couple four win seasons and hoping the quarterback is maybe good by the time we have to pay him, right? We don't want to do what what the Packers are doing, where they got one seventh seed, win a playoff game, and now they're paying their quarterback. And that's literally all they got with him on cheap was one good season because he wasn't ready for the first three. Um, you don't want to, they, they, I think they don't want to do that, right? They want to have this thing ready to go, not only to nurture the development of that quarterback, but to maximize the window. You ask any analytics person, the best way to win a Super Bowl, it's QB on a rookie contract. Uh, with Penix, as he is right now, there are just too many misses that I can expect for a Michael Penix Jr. season to feel like one where you are contending. Now, everybody can learn, but there are a couple things that also make me worry about this. A little bit of rawness is not going to freak me out, right? Like, I kind of, I don't know, I kind of feel like there's some stuff with Drake May that that will freak me out. There's some stuff with Caleb Williams that might ruin, you know, his rookie season, right? Like, I don't, I know, we're not going to overreact too much to this, you know? And I, I, those guys are top three picks and nobody disagrees with that. But um, the issue with Penix in particular, one is one of age, right? He's an older prospect and it's difficult to teach an old dog new tricks. It, part of that is, and, and I think like the instinct is, oh, he's 24. That means that, you know, he's going to be, he's going to retire with that few, many fewer years in the league. That's nobody's concern. To be honest, if, if the, the pro the downside of drafting a prospect doesn't come until like 12 years later, you did good <laughs> and you probably aren't even there still. Um, so nobody cares about that. I don't think unless you're, it's like a Brandon Whedon style, like, ah, this guy's going to be 30 in two years, but, (laughs) but not with Penix. The, the problem is learning right with, um, older brains just don't learn as easily. That's just like a known fact of like human cognition. Uh, so there's that, but then there's also the injury history that makes it more difficult for him to be, uh, to, to be more of a, like, torqued up rotational passer and i do think that that's a that that there's like an issue with the two acls that he is torn um make that a little bit difficult more difficult for him to do so as a way of kind of adapting to that and this is i'm super speculating here so please don't take me too seriously this is my my most educated guess as to what is happening i could be totally wrong correct me if i am and you've got the secret sauce but What it looks like to me is that in service of getting around that, you have developed a lot of he's he's developed like weird habits. And I'll say weird, not necessarily wrong, because, look, Philip Rivers had the weirdest throwing motion ever. It served him great, but he's got a weird throwing motion. His arm angle is off um, and and like too low. He doesn't. you, you don't see his like hips move as much as they're supposed to. There's a, there's a lot of problems with it when compared to like your sort of textbook traditional, this is what a throwing motion is supposed to look like. Um, 
And I don't see that changing. And for me, like when you've got a quarterback with some problems, but I see the path to fixing them, it is not difficult for me to still regard that guy, you know, and, and you know, get really in love with his ceiling and say, you know, this is my guy, right? Um, and, you know, project them as the first round pick that they probably are. But with Penix, it's a lot harder for me. It's, I, it's easy to see the problem and it's hard to see the fix for the problem. So why are we getting into bed with that guy? And ultimately, you can save all the draft capital you want. If you draft Mike Penix at 11 and he's off your team by year four, Christian Ponder style, you did bad. You did a bad one. Nobody's going to be like, yeah, I mean, this quarterback has sucked and we've ab absolutely wasted three more years of Justin Jefferson's athletic prime, but at least they didn't trade up. Like nobody's going to say that. Nobody's going to think that, right? This goes back to the thing. Like if Christian Ponder was a second rounder, would you really be all right with it? How do you feel about Tavares Jackson as a draft pick? right? He was a third rounder. They saved lots of draft capital. How'd 2007 go? But <laughs> I'm getting too deep in the weeds. Uh, Penix had his pro day and everybody's really excited about it. What gives? I'm an idiot. Oh my God. He proved everything wrong. Yeah, no, not really. I'll talk about the pro day next. <laughs> Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. And whether you are betting on college basketball, uh, Sweet 16 is on now, or opening day happened. The Twins are off to a great start. Don't look up their injury report if you want to scramble on any of that going on or even draft props or anything. You can find it all at FanDuel.com. And if you're new... All you got to do is sign up at FanDuel.com slash locked on. If you do that, make a $5 bet. And you can make that $5 bet on like an overwhelming favorite, whatever you think. Marvin Harrison Jr. to the Cardinals is like an overwhelming favorite right now. Uh, something like that or a, a favored baseball team or, a, you know, a UConn to trounce whoever's next. Uh, whatever it is, if you win that bet, you get 200 bucks back in bonus bets. That's 40 to 1 odds on a $5 bet. So don't miss out on that opportunity. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and get yourself a Grambling. FanDuel, make every moment more. Thanks a million for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. When you're done here, go check out the Locked On Minnesota Sports 24-7 streaming channel. All things Minnesota sports all day long. And boy, with what's going on with the Timberwolves and then like the Twins and Royce Lewis's injury, whatever's going on with that, I don't even know what it is. Uh, and the Vikings in this situation, it is a great time to have Minnesota sports blasting in your ears at all times. So uh, go do that to yourself. Do it to your brain at Locked On Minnesota Sports. <laughs> so... We got, we're in pro day season, and this is a great time to <laughs> consider what we can glean from a pro day. Uh, I have heard too much this last couple weeks about Zach Wilson's pro day, and I think we're learning the wrong lesson from that a little bit. Not that people are like wrong in their instinct to look at Zach Wilson, who got a lot of hype for his pro day from BYU when he was coming out, clearly didn't work out. And now, you know, you it's very easy for our brains to connect the dots and say, well, you know, it means nothing. And I don't think that that instinct is off base or anything like that. But I do think that there is some things that you can glean from a pro day. You just got to know what you're looking for. And to be honest, so the NFL has actually cut up like every throw from so and so's pro day and has been uploading their like six ish minute YouTube compilations where you can watch every single throw. The funny thing is, you can't see where the ball goes in these throws. And I think that's hilarious, because ultimately, if you go back and look at everything everyone wrote about Zach Wilson's pro day, all of it was about the result of a throw. How accurate was it? Where did the ball go? How did it look? And especially on deep throws, it's really easy for us to get tricked there, because it's really easy for wide receivers to adjust to a ball that's 10 yards over or under where it's supposed to be without it looking too much like they had to adjust, right? And on the flip side, if a receiver does a bad job of adjusting and they have to like make a contorted catch, a lot of times we'll blame that on the quarterback when it is the, the receiver who didn't like track the ball properly. So it's really hard for me at least to tell. I don't know, maybe you, you guys have the eagle eyes to do this, but I don't have that. I, I can't tell those apart. And so I honestly... When it comes to the pro day, when you're not throwing against defenders, you're not throwing against the coverage, you're just throwing to in, in a practice drill to a predetermined landmark, basically. I don't really care where the ball goes. 
I don't care how you throw to a predetermined landmark in a static controlled situation uh, to, you know, a receiver that's trying to make you look good. I don't care about that. But I can see your throwing motion. I can see your footwork. I can see you kind of display what you've been working on. And with somebody like, for example, um, Drake May versus like J.J. McCarthy who had had his pro day or Jaden Daniels had his pro day. Jaden Daniels had his pro day the same day as Joe Milton. And uh, the thing that all these quarterbacks are doing on their pro days now is they'll like have a coach kind of run at them as if they're an edge rusher and you can see their footwork for how they evade pressure and stay in the pocket. That has been enlightening to me. If you go to all of these these YouTube compilations and find those reps, watch the feet and look how different everybody is. I think there's something worth learning there just about quarterbacking in general. And you can kind of see what what looks more sustainable, what looks more in control and what looks like it takes a little bit longer to like stop and hold up. And, and the Joe Milton one is really funny to me because the ball goes like 70 yards like this dude's got an absolute howitzer. And that's very fun. I will grant everybody that. But you can see him. At the, the least athletic maneuvering ever. Like, he looks like a podcaster doing it. Like, it's rough. Uh, and it takes him forever to launch that ball, and you can kind of tell, like, in a real situation, in a real pocket, this would be untenable. This would be not make the team kind of quality of of pocket presence. Uh, and, and I haven't done, like, a full watch of Joe Milton. After watching that one, I probably won't. But that like that particular clip is really bad looking to me. And then ev everything you see is from people who just watched where the ball went and look and went, ooh, it went far. And that's the only conclusion that you're going to see from a lot of people. But I think you and I can rise above that. Um, and looking at Penix's pro day. For one, if you look, so I just did a quick Google uh, like a quick inc incognito Google so that I know that it's not like Google's not biased by my own searches or anything like that. And I just search up Michael Penix pro day. The headlines are all about his speed. ESPN, Washington's Michael Penix shows off speed at pro day. NBC sports shows his athleticism at pro day. AP news, Michael Penix shows off athleticism at pro day with impressive four yard, 40 yard dash. Uh, everybody's just talking about how Penix ran a good 40 and he did run a good, I think it was a four, four something. It was a good 40. Uh, and I think the idea, the sell here is that that's supposed to like assuage your, your injury concerns, but Penix is not actively recovering from an injury. Um, it's a different situation from say Hendon hookers last year where he was like unable to do anything testing wise and like actively had a rehab process that was going to leak into the season. And you had to like factor that in. Penix is perfectly healthy right now, as healthy as he will get. And I think the the uh, the sell is that he ran he run fast, so knees fine. Is that the deal? I don't know. I, I don't think that it it really sells me on what those the those issues really concern me with, which is a risk of future injury, which a forty doesn't tell you anything about, and the idea of flexibility in his throwing motion, which looking at his pro day, I still don't see, and I don't really care where the ball went. But what I do see, the change that I see is a higher arm angle. So when when Penix throws, if you watch his Washington tape, he's like kind of side arming everything. And I, and I think that that's a habit that's born of kind of having to figure out how to survive when you're not getting what you used to out of your knees because they're always hurt or there's, you know, still recovering from injury and you're trying to get back on the field. Right. Um, and. What you want to see is when you come through, you basically want the ball to be directly over your elbow, right? Because that's going to be the most in control, like, uh, trebuchet, basically, um, that, that a trebuchet gets is, is like straight up and down, right? Because when you're, when you're kind of swinging out and then back, you have to let it go at the perfect time or else you'll hook it. Um, cause your arm is going side to side, right? But if you can kind of go up and over, it's always going to go straight. And he does a better job of that. So to me, what I see is, oh, you've been working on that. Okay, that's good. That means a lot because that actually mattered to me. I think that caused some inaccuracies. So maybe you're working on that. That's really cool. And hey, if you learned and, and that's better, then I don't care that you're old anymore too because the whole thing about you being old is that you were supposed to not be able to learn. But if you can learn or you were at 
I, I should be more careful with my language. You were, it was less probable that you would learn a new thing. But if you did learn a new thing anyways, excellent, awesome, totally assuage that concern. Still want to see a lot more, and there's more than just that one issue, so it's not like it made me suddenly a Michael Penix truther, and I still don't think that he's a first-round player. He might go in the first round just by virtue of quarterback value and the way that the economics of all this work and desperation from somebody like the Broncos, but uh, I don't think that he is worth that, and I think that it's better off if he goes day two. There are other pro days, though. So uh, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, I want to talk a little bit about what we found there. So that's where we're going to wrap things up. So hopefully we have at least a sense for how to look into a pro day and not just get super like worked up about the results of the throws, right? Um, there is this clip kind of going viral from Drake May's pro day where he just airmails a really bad one right off the bat. And I think it just took him a couple throws to settle down and then he got there. And that is something that will get way more attention than any of the other throws, which doesn't feel entirely fair, right? That's like one throw of 60 of them. Maybe let's not make that the only thing we, we see. And, and for a lot of people who see anything from Drake May's Pro Day, it will be one throw, one bad one, and that's all that they will see. That doesn't quite feel representative. So again, don't worry too much about where the ball goes. But if you see a couple of really bad misses in the beginning and then he settles down, maybe that tells you that he was a little nervous. And if he's nervous, that maybe he's just going to need a couple of throws to settle down. That's actually maybe useful information. And that you can't draw that conclusion solely off of the pro day. It's just evidence toward that conclusion that you'd have to pair with interviews and, you know, watching him in other games. Does he do better in the first quarter versus the fourth quarter? That kind of stuff. But let's say we do we do all that and we come to the conclusion, yeah, this guy just kind of needs a couple to settle down every game. That is super doable, for one. Like that's not a deal breaker at all. It's a negative, but not a deal breaker. Uh, and also something that might go away as he grows up a little bit, right? And just goes away with like maturity and experience. Uh, and it's also something super manageable. There's a lot of young quarterbacks that need a, a little bit of something to, to kind of get in rhythm. Kirk Cousins needed that and he well into his thirties, right? That's super normal. Tom Brady did that, right? You just get a couple things like that, that just gets you into the rhythm of the game, a couple of quick throws just to settle you down and get you into it. When I say get into the rhythm, I mean like the cadence of a football game, getting into huddle, play call, snap count, play, huddle, play count, play call, snap count, play, like getting into that rhythm and, and being comfortable so that your brain power can be used on the actual like super high level cognition that you have to do everywhere else. Uh, and if you're a little bit jittery and you're going to have the, the, the over the salesies, the overthrowsies when you're a little bit jittery, yeah, I would definitely want to know that. Um, but it's not a huge deal. And then there were a whole bunch of other throws that made everybody go, wow. And everybody says, oh, Drake may had this phenomenal pro day, but what I'm looking at isn't where the ball goes. I'm looking at his feet and what I really wanted to see from Drake may because we were in a controlled environment, I wanted to see how he did on that thing where a coach runs at him and as though he's a, a pass rusher and how he evades that, right? And what I saw very much confirmed the concern that I had from his tape. And again, I, I've done full episodes on all these guys. I've done Patreon videos on all these guys at patreon.com slash NFL. So for more comprehensive analysis, you can go to those places. But from that, one of the things that I talk about is uh, when he moves in the pocket, he abandons his base. So you got your nice, you know, your your feet are on the ground and your, your cleats in the ground, you're ready to throw, right? And when you run, like just, if you just can, if you can and you go outside and, and stand like there's a, like you're throwing the football well, when the snow melts, I guess. Uh, sorry, Minnesotans. No, I'm not. <laughs> stand there like you're gonna throw a football and then just like run forward. Or like run like to, to the side as though somebody's chasing you, right? And what you'll notice that your feet all automatically want to do if your feet are shoulder width apart is that they'll want to step right in front of you and then go one foot in front of the other. That is how our bodies are like built to, to run longer distances and get a longer stride by, I mean, you're not like waddling, right? 
um, by putting one foot as far in front of the other as possible, which means our feet will sort of center on our body. His do, do that. Once your feet are centered up with each other, it takes now additional steps to re shoulder width them. If that makes a lot of sense, I'm really sorry to audio listeners. It's difficult to explain that, but if that makes sense to you, if you just try it, you'll see exactly what I mean immediately. And so his feet do that. So what they will teach you is you've got to always keep your feet shoulder width because it puts you on a base that allows you to pull the trigger on a throw a lot faster and you don't have to stop and reset. Now maybe the window's closed, right? Like you want that to be a more streamlined process. So this is one of the things I love about Jaden Daniels. And when I saw his pro day, I saw that. Um, when I saw Joe Milton's pro day, just not even close to anything resembling polished footwork in the pocket. And it just doesn't look like the kind of athlete that he is. But with May, um, he's still, even in a, in a controlled environment where it's not like a, you know, a, a, a fear and a panic that comes into you because a big giant guy is bearing down on you. Like I kind of get it sometimes in a real game situation because you are operating off of pure instinct, but in a pro day it's controlled and you can kind of fake it till you make it, right? If you really think that that's an important thing to showcase, you can showcase it. And he didn't showcase it. So it's something that he hasn't come into this process feeling as though he needs to fix. And that is a perfectly valid decision. Maybe there's other stuff that he's focusing on that he feels is more important that I'm not seeing because I'm just a podcasting idiot. But that is a concern to me. And it's something that would you know, be the difference between, if I'm the Bears, right, it'd be the difference between taking somebody like him or Kayla Williams, or for the Commanders, who seem very likely to take Jaden Daniels, especially if you listen to a Brian Kelly interview, or a Commanders reporter was like, what do you think about him for the Commanders? And he's like, I think he'd be great for the Commanders. But the way he said it was like very foot and mouth, <laughs> like maybe they just gave the game away. So they might take Jaden Daniels over Drake May, and I would not be surprised at all to learn that the reason is footwork in the pocket and that that Daniels is just looks a little bit more polished. Daniels is a lot older so you kind of expect that polish right and Drake May has time to learn um but that's why personally I agree with the commanders doing that loosely I, they're all in a tier all those top three are in a tier for me I'm not gonna go too crazy but loosely I would agree with the commanders doing that uh, and that's kind of why and so the pro day is an opportunity for you to at least say look I'm learning this thing I don't have it down, but I'm learning this thing. And that didn't show up. So to me, I don't know that Drake May had that great of a pro day. I know that that's a scorching hot take, but I was looking for something specific and I didn't see it. And I was tunnel visioning on something specific, right? But if you want to really play this game, go back and look at the Zach Wilson Pro Day throw. If you just if you Google Zach Wilson Pro Day, it's the only throw you'll see. And look at his feet. It doesn't look great. He runs around, he abandons his base, it takes him forever to relaunch it, and then he he throws up a pass, receiver has to flatten out a whole bunch for it. It doesn't look that good. It's it's a big deep bomb and big pass go boom, but you're not recording stats here. This is not a thing that the Pro Day is not a a box score simulator it's a chance to showcase skills and if you just keep your eye on the ball and fall for all the eye candy you're going to miss a lot of the actual nuanced information that you can actually glean from this stuff so i i encourage you to at least give it a shot and that's what i'm doing a lot of the information that i've talked about all this offseason is new information to me and maybe i'm not incorporating it correctly but I feel super confident in just going out on a limb and applying that. And if I'm wrong, I'm almost certainly going to learn a lot from that. And that's fine, too. So I encourage you to come on that journey with me and take your eye off the damn ball. That's the, the, the second biggest draft thing that I have learned in the last two years is take your eye off the damn ball. Uh, and... The first thing is focus on what a player does every single play. What are the consistent things? And take your eye off the ball. Uh, next week, we'll see if we've got a trade to talk about. <laughs> we'll see. Today would be the day if we are going to mirror the Trey Lance trade. 
which we there's no reason we have to do that, right? And I would imagine that a lot of this these trade talks were contingent on pro days and everybody finishing their QB evaluations. They probably don't want to have incomplete evaluations before agreeing to draft trades. Um, but if it does happen today, we will talk about it Monday. Until then, stay safe, okay? Drink some water. I love you. And as always, skull.